So this is the question, one of your conceptual questions that comes from the chapter in the questions. And I want you to go over this. So, you know, I don't go over all the conceptual questions all the time, but this particular question, I want you to spend a little bit of time with because, um, so we are in chapter 13, covering Newton's law of universal gravitation, and it's the last chapter of mechanics that we'll cover. I mean, we do have chapter 14, fluids, but um, that will be added on later at the end of the semester as kind of a afterthought. So this is our capstone of our coverage of mechanics. And this uh, particular setup is really uh, apt because it, we can use it to illustrate just uh, so many things. I mean, okay, so we can use it to illustrate Kepler's uh, first and second law, which is what this elliptical orbit with these two foci are showing. But we can also use this picture to talk about some of the things that, um, well, one new thing that we are talking about in this chapter, chapter 13, which is Newton's law of universal gravitation. If you have mass m and a small mass m, then uh, separated by some distance r, then the force between them, um, by which we mean there's a, um, there's a force on both of them. So it, Newton's law of universal gravitation is consistent with the Newton's third law, which means the, gra the expression for gravitational force, it gives the gravitational force on this mass, a constant times its mass times mass of the other thing divided by r squared. And this same expression also applies to the other mass. So it's a, a law of a mutual attraction. And if you want to be fastidious, you could swap the order of these two masses, g times the big mass m times the small mass m divided by r squared, but you know, multiplications commute, so it's the same quantity. So, so that's the one thing that you can look at in this setup. And starting with that expression of Newton's law of universal gravitation, which acts along this line that connects the two masses, we can also apply other things. Um, think back through the, the chapters that we went through. Um, so there's the force analysis and kinematics, and I have a feeling it's gonna get a little bit difficult because this distance R changes from one location to the other. So let me not worry about the force analysis and kinematics just yet because that could get complicated. But we can think about the chapter eight content, conservation of energy, for example. So when we are talking about work and conservation of energy, we said gravity is a conservative force. And even though before we were using this expression as a good approximation, as long as you are near the surface of Earth, the more precise version for gravitational potential energy in a situation like this, um, it, it holds and it, it, uh, if you have a system of things where the only forces interacting are gravity, then you can say energy is conserved. So, um, so here the, the expression for gravitational potential energy that applies wouldn't be this, but the more um, accurate expression that applies for varying distances r would be g times um, the product of masses still, and then divided by only one factor of r, oh, and there's a minus sign in front. Um, and with I, I talk about the universal reference point when we drive this, and um, when r is, as r goes to infinity, this gravitational potential energy goes to zero. That's how we set the reference. And um, and as you come closer, you are at a smaller gravitational energy than zero because things will go from higher potential energy to lower potential energy. So the closer the two objects are, the less more negative or uh, the smaller, well, less uh, lower the gravitational potential energy is. That's frankly how I remember this <laughs> negative sign because otherwise I, it looks like I'm describing things that will fall apart. 
So, so that's the expression for gravitational potential energy in this setup. So if you look at something like the total energy, which is the kinetic energy, one half mv squared. So for example, um, total energy of this mass, um, although that's not entirely accurate, but <laughs> total energy, one half mv squared plus g times a product of the masses divided by r, this quantity is conserved. So as this uh, mass is out at a farther distance, oh we then most that way. Yeah, as this uh, is out at a farther distance where the gravitational potential energy is higher, uh, its uh, kinetic energy will be less. So you can guess from the principle of conservation of energy that the velocity here would be at a minimum because your gravitational potential energy is at a maximum. By the way, remember there's nothing at F2. There's no object there. So it's this is where the small mass m is farthest the big, from the big mass m. And as it continues to orbit, when it's at this point, at the closest point, if the total energy remains constant, then we can see that, um, oh, wait, wait, sorry. I <laughs> sign error again. Minus g. As your gravitational energy is more negative, so lower in value, um, your your um, your your kinetic energy will have to be higher, to, so that your total energy is uh, is constant. So this uh, would give you the maximum speed. And by the way, this uh, whole thing for a bound state, the total energy should be less than zero. So that if you imagine the this uh, orbiting thing kind of more or less at rest, if you imagine it's a v-min being more or less zero at the infinity away, then um, then then you know well not at infinity away. If uh, it's at any this as this is zero, if it's at any value of r uh, less than infinity, then this whole thing will be negative. So, so in this uh, orbital motion, you can see places where conservation of energy principle applies. Um, in fact, uh, <laughs> that's what you can use to answer A, at which point the orbit is greatest, the least. Now, I, when, um, and there's another way to answer this question. It's a matter of the authorial intent. When they wrote the question, how did they want you to answer it? And I, gave you one way you could have possibly answer it using our chapter eight content, chapter eight and I think chapter nine, ch those conservation law content, but you might think, huh, is there, um, but that seems a little bit curious that you are going so far back in chapters, like is there something that we introduce in this chapter that we can use? Then yeah, there is. Um, so you could get V min here and V max here. You could get that through uh, Kepler's second law. That's what I paraphrased in lecture as well. Kepler's second law says that for a, a planetary body orbiting the sun, the um, farther away it is, the slower it moves, and the closer it is, the faster it moves. So that uh, if you are looking at the line connecting the two, it sweeps the same area in equal amount of time. That's the actual statement of second law. So uh, you can see that um, what we argued through using conservation of energy in a qualitative sense, yeah, it agrees with the Kepler second law. And you could answer question, part, question A using Kepler second law. That's probably quicker. Um, but I want you to draw this connection to the things that we learned before, because this is the kind of, it's the um, exciting thing in physics when you can unify different disparate uh, theories. So Kepler's theory or laws of planetary motion, as accurate as it is, as experiment-based as it is, it lacks in one thing in that it's a, it's a law of planetary motion. It's not universally applicable. So it's, uh, um, so as a physicist uh, looking at that, we are in search of a more fundamental law that would both explain motion of planets and motion of other things. And uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation is one piece in that. 
and conservation of energy is another piece in that. Now, oh, <laughs> I guess, sorry, I gotta read these questions. That's part B, <laughs> yeah, conservation law. <laughs> okay. And uh, there are some other things here. We uh, describe the relative direction between these three at this point. Um, yeah, I think you can work that out, so I'll just leave that for you. And I want you to discuss a couple of things, a couple additional things that you don't maybe necessarily need to get into in answering this particular question, but this is a good um, good situation, example setup to talk about the, to review these other things. So when we talk about conservation laws, energy wasn't the only thing that we discussed being conserved. We discussed other things being conserved. So we discussed the conservation of momentum. And we discussed the conservation of uh, angular momentum. And I think that's basically it. Um, um, we don't, um, yeah, we don't introduce any other conserved quantities. I mean, there are more. And uh, as you go into higher levels of physics, you do see them like conservation of charge, conservation of this and that. Um, in this class, we've covered conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum. And those three are the only conserved quantities that we are dealing with. So um, let's say if a momentum is conserved here, I, I think it's uh, easy to say that momentum is not conserved because you can kind of see here, you know, you look at this mass um, at this point here, it's moving that way. And at some point, so, you know, that direction of velocity is also the direction of momentum. And when it's here, velocity is pointed downward that way. Can say yeah that's the direction of momentum it's clearly changing and you can even uh, blame that change of momentum to this external force which is changing the momentum of mass m so i, I think if you are limiting yourself to just to looking at mass m it's uh, so easy to just say oh, yeah of course momentum is conserved so all right let's move on we are not doing anything with it but let's not just leave it there let's uh, see if uh, we can expand our view because when we talk about especially conservation of momentum the distinction that matters is the internal external distinction and that distinction is a uh, only a matter of definition what you consider to be your system things inside your system those are internal things outside the system are external. So when I defined my system as just this mass, gravitational force was external force, and I had all that, but it doesn't have to be that way. I can define my system to be this, both the mass and the large mass, or in the planetary scale, both the sun and the planet or sorry, that's the solar system scale. And in the planetary scale, both the planet and the, and the satellite. And under that consideration, we can ask this question, should my momentum be conserved if uh, this is the system I'm working with? And I hope your answer is yes, that, because you're only interact this force wise this is a really simple system you have this force here and you have its newton's second law uh, pair right here so you only have one pair of forces that are internal and conservative and all that internal force so so your momentum should be conserved so you might say uh, so what's up uh, i mean if my momentum is really conserved how is it um, varying so wildly from this point where my momentum was pointed to the right to this point where my momentum is pointed to left? And this is where it's useful to remember that momentum, all, in addition to being parallel to velocity, it's a mass times velocity. So, if you look at momentum of this large mass planet or the sun, depending on what scale you are thinking of, momentum of this large mass, 
is given by mass times velocity. It's a larger mass times. So, um, so really all you need is for the momentum value to be the same between this and this, or it, it somehow the changes in the momentum of the small mass to be canceled out by changes in the momentum of the big mass. So this is where you can say, hmm, I can, with a much larger mass, I can achieve the same uh, change of momentum as the change of momentum of the smaller mass with the change of velocity that's much, much, much smaller than the change of velocity here. Well, it's uh, uh, going to be kind of proportional or inversely proportional to the mass, depending on how you construct the ratios. So, so when you look at this uh, orbiting thing, um, it's not going to be technically true that the velocity of this large mass is zero. Especially when you consider momentum conservation, it must be moving. Now, that might make you worry a little. Hey, does that mean when I was uh, working through conservation of energy, I really should have included the energy of the big mass so that it's one half small m v small m squared plus one half big m times v big m squared minus g. And I think this interaction, interaction gravitational force, I should just have one of it. I shouldn't double count it. Um, so it should have, should I have had this from the beginning? Well, depends on context. If these two masses are similar in mass, then yeah, you need this to actually account for the total energy. Because as this orbits, as this moves, there's a, their energy is transferred between the two. So yeah, you do need to. On the other hand, imagine a scenario where your big mass is much larger than the smaller mass. Then this is what you can see from looking at this uh, relationship between momenta. So if uh, somehow, if you have the net momentum that's zero, then you can say, okay, whatever magnitude of the big momentum is, big MV, that's equal to big MV, M. <laughs> uh, it's equal to the magnitude of small momentum, small M, VM small m, so that they can uh, cancel each other out in vector addition and all that. And this is what I hope you will see. It's v sub big M is equal to the ratio of the masses, m over big M times small uh, <laughs> v small m. So the velocity here is a smaller by this factor. And the reason I'm pointing out and it's important is that these speeds, they go into the expressions for kinetic energy as squared. So even though the kinetic energy is larger for the larger mass, that larger part, it's only linear in power. But the thing that's going to reduce the speed, it's going to go as a square of the mass. So when you work out this expression in terms of Vm, it's one half, big M times uh, small m squared over big M squared times V small m squared. So you see this cancels out. And I could pull out a vector of M. I, I guess I could so that one half a small m times small m over big M times V m squared. So you can say this as uh, M goes to infinity or as M becomes big M becomes to be much larger than small m, the ratio small m over big M, this goes to zero. So there's a limit at which this kinetic energy is going to be negligible. And that's what we are working with at the very beginning. That's why I didn't account for the kinetic energy of the planet, and I, I was fine with it. it. It wasn't going to result in a significant error in the situations where mass of the planet is so much larger than the satellite. So, so, okay, that's the discussion of the conservation of momentum in this context and some of the consequences to think through. And uh, let me end this discussion. Uh, let me first clear out some of the writings. And after having done that, so, uh, so we talked, we discussed the um, 
the issues uh, associated with the conservation of momentum. And now let me end by um, looking at looking at this picture through the lens of the conservation of angular momentum. So I guess the first question to ask is, is angular momentum conserved? And, um, and I want to this time want it to be a little bit more restrictive because it's so easy to say, oh yeah, angular momentum is conserved because all the interacting forces are internal. So that's why angular momentum is conserved. And I think that doesn't quite say as much as we can say. So let me retreat my box and limit my system again to just around my small mass m. So there is an external gravitational force. So for my consideration of if angular momentum is conserved, this is the question. This external force due to gravity, does this apply any torque? Well, let's... Uh, um, let's find the lever arm. So what we are going to do is first, we are going to extend this force into line of action. And the line of action, it goes through this point. So, oh, so my lever arm is zero because my line of action goes through my center of rotation. So this external gravitational force on this body, it produces zero. Even though the external force is not zero, external torque is zero. And this is a, a, for a special type of force, this is always the case. The type of the force is what we call central force. And I guess there's a couple different ways you can define or describe a central force. Uh, gravity is an example of central force. And central force is, um, characterized by the fact that uh, when you uh, draw the line of action for the central force, then that line of action goes through the center of rotation, you know, central force. <laughs> it only points in the radial directions. It doesn't point in tangential directions. So central force uh, as a uh, central force um, in the reference of um, with the center of rotation about the uh, I guess center of the of the center where you define the radial direction out of um, it central force causes no uh, causes no torque because uh, torque about uh, I don't know force center I don't know the exact terms for these things I do know the phrase central force um, so so yeah gravitational force on this body it um, it doesn't generate any torque. So what we should be able to say is that our angular momentum of just that small body that uh, must be conserved because angular momentum is conserved. And let's see what that conserved quantity is. So I need to write out an expression for that angular momentum. We have a couple different expressions for angular momentum. Um, I think you've seen angular momentum written in a, an analogy to translational momentum, which is, you know, momentum is mv. And I can write this in a similar way. The rotational version of mass, rotational inertia, times the rotational version of uh, velocity or angular velocity. And yeah, this is perfectly fine expression for angular momentum. Um, but maybe it's a little bit obscure to write it out this way because you've got to now figure out what is I, what is omega. And I, I think uh, for this motion of a point mass, it doesn't quite make as much sense. So let me define my, or let me write down the definition of angular momentum, which is not what I just wrote, but this version here. Angular momentum is defined through this cross product, R cross P. The displacement vector that's from here to there, that's my R of same magnitude to R, uh, cross product with the momentum vector here. And when you take the cross product, you know, so um, 
So let me do it. So R cross uh, R cross P. So my thumb is pointing into the screen. And let me just do it from my perspective. But yeah, it's pointing into the screen. So, so that's the direction of your angular momentum. The angular momentum is a vector pointing into the screen. And, um, and the gravity being central force and there being no torque due to gravity means this quantity here is conserved. And I can expand this out a little bit using, you know, momentum is mv. So I can say, all right, so this is mass times r cross v. And in general, this r cross v can be a, you know, complicated term because the magnitude of r cross v is r v sine theta where theta is angle between them. So at these um, arbitrary points here, the r cross v is going to be not quite um, um, easily, um, not going to be an expression that you can easily work with. Um, but if we imagine a few special points, we can imagine, for example, these extreme points here. So at this point where my velocity points this way, my r is perpendicular to that velocity. So I can say sine theta is one. And the same thing at the other extreme point here, you can say your momentum and r are perpendicular. So at those special points, you, say you have this. The angular momentum, the magnitude, is equal to mass times radius at that point times v. Um, and you know, make sure that you have the condition where r and v are perpendicular. You can get it at these extreme points for an elliptical orbit, or for a circular orbit, it'll be true in every point. Now, when you stare at this expression for a bit and consider the fact that this is again conserved, that's the thing we want to kind of hammer home here, that angular momentum is conserved in this orbital motion. I hope you see this, this MRV, this uh, product is a quantity that is supposed to be same at two different points in orbit, at this point and at this point. So let me just write down MRV uh, at point one where R is larger than uh, R1 is larger than R2. That quantity ought to be same as the conserved angular momentum quantity and R2, V2. And canceling out mass, because it's on both sides, what you see is that this product, R1, V1, is the same as R2, V2. And this turns out to be identical to Kepler's second law. You can work this out geometrically here. You know, imagine this is moving some infinitesimal distance uh, dl, and the area of this uh, very uh, tiny pizza slice that's going to be approximately r times dl. Imagine doing the same calculation here dl, and then r times dl will give you the area of this slice. And the statement that the product of rv from one point to the other doesn't change, that statement is, um, so that's the statement you might get from Kepler's second law. And it's also the same statement that you would say looking at the consequence of the conservation of angular momentum. So before, when we were talking about part B earlier, we were saying, oh yeah, conservation of energy law says that speed will be the smallest here and greatest here. And to a degree, that's right. That's not wrong. But the thing that's more closely related to the, um, to the Kepler's second law is not conservation of energy, 
but conservation of uh, angular momentum. Because frankly, conservation of energy, you know, this looks complicated. Like it doesn't feel like it would uh, easily result in such a simple statement like Kepler versus second law. But angular momentum, it does uh, result in simple statement like Kepler versus second law. And, um, and for a um, satellite that's orbiting the planet in a, a correct way, whether you use one or the other, it will yield the same value. So um, sometimes the textbook authors make this mistake where uh, they give some uh, orbital parameters randomly uh, without realizing that, oh, because of these double constraints of conservation of energy and angular momentum, you uh, there are some parameters of orbit that you might think is a free parameter, but isn't. So, uh, but yeah, let me leave that orbital mechanics stuff to um, your future class. I'll, uh, I think I've talked enough about this uh, orbital motion here. I think I've talked about all the things that I want you to. So, um, so let me this uh, let me leave this here. Um,